Welcome back to our review series for AP Psychology and this video focusing on unit four, which is learning. So let's go ahead and get started. In this unit, you want to focus on a few specific learning topics. Now remember, these are the broad topics that I'm giving you, not the specific standards or concept understandings that College Board lies out in their, their standards, the very specific learning targets. I do that so that you can see that there's more studying you need to do in those areas as laid out on the screen here in the, the learning topics. So the big topics we'll talk about in this video and that you'll need to kind of extend and study deeper into is classical conditioning and kind of an extending of classical conditioning with John Watson um, and then operant conditioning and observational learning. Now, according to the course and exam description laid out by College Board, all of unit four um, with learning is under skill one concept understanding. So that means that it's going to be fair game in that first FRQ. Now, I'm also including some graph interpretation in here, uh, which to me that might fit better under skill number two and three, but the College Board does not list skill two or three in this unit. So that tells me it's not going to be in, in the second FRQ, it's gonna be in the first one, but that doesn't mean that they can't ask you to interpret a graph because there's a very specific standard um, that I'll kind of point out here that says that you have to be able to um, understand the graphical representation of learning, of various learning principles in a graph. And we'll talk about that in this video. So the first topic is, of course, classical conditioning. Uh, with each of these topics, you want to make sure that you know the big research studies, that you know those inside and out. And the first one, of course, is Pavlov's dogs. So let me give you a quick review of the principles of classical conditioning as laid out by Ivan Pavlov in his Pavlov's dogs experiment. So the unconditioned stimulus, remember to think of unconditioned as unlearned or naturally occurring. Okay, so um, a naturally eliciting stimulus like thunder or a loud clap of a noise makes someone startle if it's unexpected, right? Um, or the pain from like a needle, a shot that is an unconditioned naturally eliciting stimulus and the response to that, the jumping or the flinching in pain is the naturally occurring response, therefore is the unconditioned response. Remember that in classical conditioning, we pair to stimuli, okay? And so the unconditioned stimulus is paired with what originally starts as the neutral stimulus and that neutral stimulus turns into a conditioned stimulus. So the dogs in this, in Ivan Pavlov's research, they salivate not to the sight of food, they salivated to the taste of the food being in their mouth, right? Salivation allows us to break down our food. And so what he realized is that dogs were salivating to um, the sound of the food being made and even the researchers coming and giving them their food. And so he extended that into other research. So then the conditioned response oftentimes is just the unconditioned response transferring over to responding now to what was the neutral stimulus. Now, J.B. Um, Watson with Little Albert, you want to remember his study with babies and studying um, if fear could be um, trained, right, essentially into, into a child. And so the unconditioned stimulus there was the loud noise. It was like a big gong looking thing, I guess. Um, the response being fear or flinching or crying, you could say. The neutral stimulus being a white mouse. And so the babies eventually were conditioned to respond to the mouse with fear because they paired the mouse and the gong, the mouse and the gong over and over and over. Now remember that phase where Pavlov's dogs paired the bell and the food, the bell and the food, and Watson with little Albert paired the mouse with the gong, the mouse with the gong, the mouse with the gong. That phase where they are pairing two stimuli is called acquisition, where they are making the association, the, the subject is making the association between the two stimuli. 
Now, some things that we can kind of infer from Watson's study are a few other vocab terms that you want to make sure that you go over, including stimulation, stimulus, generalization, and discrimination. So when little Albert moved away before he could be unconditioned, there was lots of speculation into what happened to little Albert. Did he generalize his fear and now he was afraid of white bunnies and Santa's beard and big white puffy clouds because they're white and fluffy like the mouse? Or did he discriminate and he was only afraid of the mouse and not other similar but different subjects or stimulus? Um, the most accepted answer there was that his fear just went extinct, right? So what happens after, um, so when you're in the research process or the conditioning process of pairing bell food, bell food, bell food, you only know that the dog is conditioned when you take away the food, right? And you only present the bell. And if the dog salivates, they are conditioned. Well, if you do that over and over and over again, only the bell over and over and over, just like with little Albert, the white mouse, over and over and over again, like in natural life, right? Um, you don't see a white mouse and a big loud noise comes about. That's, that's not what happens in real life. The response will go extinct. Sometimes people will experience so spontaneous recovery. So for instance, if you were bitten by a dog as a child and then you lived throughout most of your life totally fine with dogs, but all of a sudden you have this like immense fear of one particular dog um, or of all dogs in general just at one later time in your life, that would be spontaneous recovery. Now, Rascorla had a contingency model that he kind of added to classical conditioning. And he said that our brains, including those of Pavlov's dogs, are not robots. We don't just, boom, respond to the, the bell. The dogs don't. Uh, and the babies didn't just, boom, respond to the white mouse. They were thinking about it. Okay, so Rascorla adds cognition to this whole conditioning thing. And he says that the more the subject can determine that A will lead to B, that one stimulus will lead to B, the more contingent they are on each other, the stronger the association is, meaning we are thinking about both of them together, the more likely we are to respond. And this also lets us know about other principles, including Garcia's um, taste aversion. There's also Tolman's latent learning and Kohlberg's um, insight learning. You wanna make sure that you go over all of those terms. Now, graphs of classical conditioning. This is a graph of how, what responses look like over time when they are being conditioned, classically conditioned. So in this first part of the graph, you'll see that the response is getting stronger and that it wasn't not existing at first. And then we have it growing pretty quickly um, when the CS and UCS are presented together. Notice that the CS is before the US, right? The condition stimulus, the bell, or the mouse is before the food or the gong, right? Um, for good reason. You might want to go over why that is. Um, and then we kind of, um, then we only present the conditioned stimulus, the bell or the gong, or I'm sorry, not the bell or the gong, um, the bell or the mouse by themselves. And you'll notice that the response slowly kind of goes down. Um, and then they have a pause when like they go overnight or somehow pause in the conditioning and they'll use the condition stimulus again, but they respond again. Okay. So what you want to be able to do is apply these three vocabulary terms to this graph. And when you do that, this is what it will look like. Acquisition is happening in that first phase and then extinction eventually happens once they're presenting only the condition stimulus then they would spontaneously recover that um, response after some time, but it cr more quickly goes away or becomes extinct. Operant conditioning, I'm gonna go through these quickly, okay? So if you need to pause and rewind, please do. Reinforcement means you are increasing the behavior. Punishment means you are decreasing the behavior. That's all you need to know. So you need to ask yourself when you're deciphering, okay, is it positive or negative? You need to ask yourself, okay, would this increase the behavior or would this decrease the behavior? And that will help you to determine if it's a reinforcement or a punishment. Positive or negative is not good or bad. It is simply adding positive 
or negative taking away of a stimulus. So getting paid for, to go to work, right? That is a positive reinforcement because it's going to increase your behavior of going to work and it adds the stimulus of money. Negative is the taking away of something to still increase the behavior would be negative reinforcement. So if I tell my son, if you sit and work on your homework this evening for an hour, you don't have to do the dishes tonight. I'm taking away a stimulus that will increase his behavior of doing the homework, right? Whereas if I say, if you hit your brother again, you're going to have laundry this week. That's a punishment. I would add a stimulus to decrease the behavior um, or taking away a stimulus to decrease the behavior would be if you hit your brother again you don't get iPad time something like that and then there's the schedules of reinforcement which we're going to go over here more specifically because of graphs really quickly remembering the differences here fixed meaning it's predictable variable meaning you don't know when the reinforcement is coming Ratio is based on the number of times responding, and the interval is based on the amount of time spent responding. So they're just two different kinds of behavior. So ratio would be something like betting, and interval would be something like fishing. It's not the number of times you fish, it's the amount of time you spend fishing. Okay, so here is a graph of the schedules of reinforcement and that cumulative number of responses and how quickly, based off of time being down in the bottom, how quickly we gain the response, um, the, the behavior, I guess, that's being operantly conditioned, but then how long does it last, meaning how resistant to extinction it is. So you need to be able to apply the four schedules of reinforcement to that graph. And here's what that would look like. So the interpretation of this would be that ratio schedules, they allow for faster learning or responses, but interval schedules are more resistant to extinction um, and therefore are technically stronger. And then of course there's observational learning. There's not a ton there other than you need to know is Albert Bandura and he used the Bobo dolls with children observing adults beating the crap out of these dolls. Um, and that they also though, here's the kicker, saw those adults being reinforced for their behavior. And therefore the child said, wow, if I act that way, I'm gonna get this. Ooh, that's great. And then he also recognized that cursing at the dog, at the dolls and using weapons, although that was not um, modeled by the adults, was higher, there was a higher likelihood for the children to engage in those behaviors, even though it wasn't modeled. All right, guys, that's unit four for you. It was a lot, it was quick, but it's, it really is like one of the smallest, if not the smallest unit. Yeah, it's the smallest unit, um, but it's really specific content. And um, so you wanna make sure that you, you review those as best you can. So stay tuned and I'll see you for the next video. Bye.